is wild camping dangerous? Is wild camping legal? What shelter do I use? What do I need to take with me? Do I need to spend a fortune? And how do I go to the toilet whilst wild camping? These are just a few of the questions that I get asked on a regular basis. So in this video, I plan to answer those and many other questions as I give you my top 10 tips for wild camping in the UK. Whether you're a beginner or not, keep watching because you may learn something you hadn't considered or you may have some advice that I've missed. If so, drop a comment below. Buongiorno YouTube, it's Trev here, Summit or Nothing. If you haven't already, please take the time to hit the like button now and subscribe to us for more hiking, wild camping and gear reviews. There's loads for you to go back and watch and we have even compiled a playlist of some of our favourite episodes. I'll link here. Wild camping has become really popular in recent years. It's great to know that so many people have taken to the outdoors and are enjoying our countryside. However, with increasing numbers, it's now more important than ever to share tips and some of the rules to ensure that we all make the most of this amazing hobby while staying comfortable, safe and responsible. Number one, choose the right shelter for you. Notice I didn't say tent then. Although a tent is the most popular, there are many other ways to enjoy sleeping in the outdoors. I must say that I do prefer a tent. You can keep the elements and any creepy crawlies out of your sleeping area, but I have enjoyed tarp and bivy camping in the past and also done a spot of hammock camping too. Tarp and bivy camping is a more adventurous way of enjoying the great outdoors. It can be considerably lightweight, so it gives you a bit more freedom and is ideal for anyone who likes to travel light. Hammock camping is really great fun, but you do end up carrying considerable extra gear and it also ties you to one location, literally. And you do have to be near trees, which is no good for what I do up on Dartmoor. So let me know in the comments which type of camping you prefer as I go deeper into camping in tents. Tent camping, where to start? You could spend anything from £50 to £1,000 on a tent, but you don't necessarily need to fork out for expensive tents for the majority of UK camping. A lot of the budget tents really hold their own in adverse weather, and sometimes the pricier tents are just as likely to fail. Things to consider are, are you camping alone? If so, then a one or two man tent would be preferable. I find that two men rarely fit inside a two man tent along with all their kit, but I myself enjoy a two man tent on my own as it gives me lots of room to lay out my gear. And if you are sharing a tent with a partner, then perhaps a three man tent would be better for you. Perhaps one with a door on either side too. What you don't want to do, a big no no in wild camping, is take a larger family tent especially out in the national parks. There are campsites for that kind of camping. With wild camping, discretion is the key. How long are you likely to carry your tent? I would say that lightweight tents are preferable if you want to do a lot of walking. Anything between one to two kilograms seems to be ideal, but you may opt for a slightly heavier tent in the harsh conditions. You can get tents that use your hiking poles, which are lighter still, but as I've found out on many occasions, they can be somewhat of a faff to put up. Are you going to be a fair weather camper? If so, then you don't need a four season tent. If you're going to go out in all kinds of weather, then you may want a tent that the fly sheet goes up first, or better still, one in which the inner skin and the fly sheet attach together. That way the likelihood of getting the inside of your tent wet is greatly reduced. Geodesic dome tents are ideal in the stronger winds as are tunnel tents. You will get more room in a dome tent and the design is quite rigid and robust but tunnel tents are a lower profile to the ground and can take quite a battering. Tunnel tents tend to have a smaller footprint as well which gives you more scope of where you can pitch them but they can feel quite cramped inside as they are low. Uh, it's also best to know how to pitch your tent before you take it out. Have a run through in your garden or at a park if you can, because the last thing you want to do is struggle in the dark if things haven't quite gone to plan. You can find links to the different types of tents that I've used below in the video description. But now that we've sorted our tents, let's go on to tip number two. Tip number two, pack only what you need. The easiest thing in the world is to overpack your backpack and the additional weight can not only be a hindrance, it can also be painful and even dangerous. When you're starting out, you have a tendency to overthink and pack all sorts of things that you don't need. 
On our early camps, Naif and I were both carrying in excess of 18 kilograms each. We were sore and tired by the end of the day, and from then on, we both knew we had to watch exactly what we were carrying. The first thing we did when we got home was assess what we took and we didn't use. Mostly, it was excessive food and clothes. We also downsized our backpacks on the proviso that if you take a 65 litre backpack, you will fill a 65 litre backpack. The trick is to take as small a backpack as you can and that way you really consider what you're putting in and you only take what you know you really can't do without. I've now got my winter camping gear down enough to fit inside a 35-45 litre backpack, which is a vast improvement even from a year ago. Once you've been out once or twice, you will soon come to know where you can save those extra kilos. You could soon become obsessed with cutting out kilos, but then you will want to weigh it up to your own personal needs. At the end of the day, the question is, do you shred weight from your pack at the risk of compromising comfort during your camp? So what should you pack? I'll run through the essential items now, but we will take a closer look at some of these areas later on in the video. You will need a decent sleeping system, a cook set, a mug, a spork, a torch, and a headlamp, a few items of spare clothes, waterproofs, toiletries and a trowel, navigational aids, a power bank, first aid kit and insect repellent. Obviously food and drink is important, but you can strategically work out what meals you will need for your trip. We will discuss that in greater depth in a moment. Number three, know the wild camping laws. Wild camping is technically not legal in the majority of the UK, although there are a few places in which it is allowed, and a few where it is tolerated, as long as you stick to the wild camping rules and practice leave no trace. You'll know if you watch my channel that you are quite within your rights to wild camp on Dartmoor National Park, but only on common land and areas highlighted in the Dartmoor camping map which I'll link below. There are also certain bylaws in place that you should follow. It's also legal to wild camp pretty much anywhere in Scotland as long as you abide by the Scottish Outdoor Access Code, also linked below, which laid down some guidelines on how to camp responsibly. However, camping is prohibited in Loch Lomond and the Trussocks National Park due to overuse. In the Lake District, wild camping is tolerated and although it's not legal, there are bylaws in place such as ensuring you camp on open land and above the highest fell wall. Other national parks have no bylaws in place that allow wild camping, although they do tolerate responsible camping following similar guidelines mentioned before. So before you go out, it really is important to swat up on the wild camping rules for the area you wish to visit and to seek permission wherever required. We will turn for a closer look on how to camp in a while, but first, tip number four, get to yourself a decent sleeping system. With any aspect of wild camping, you can spend as much or as little as you like, but one area that I think you need to get right as soon as possible is the sleeping system. Not only do you want to be comfortable during the night in a tent, more importantly, you want to stay warm. Hindsight is a wonderful tool, and from my own experience, this is an area I wish I had a grip on from the start. I was either carrying sleeping pads and sleeping bags that were too light and inefficient or too heavy and cumbersome and for the majority of the time uncomfortable. I tried every combination over the years. I tried sleeping bags with liners in which would usually still leave me cold and also increase the discomfort when the liner would move independently of the sleeping bag and I would constantly tangle up throughout the night. I also used to carry two sleeping pads, one foam pad that would add extra insulation between the lightweight budget sleeping pad. And not only was I carrying twice as much as was necessary, but again, the trouble I had in the night wrestling with two sleeping pads which wanted to go in separate directions would always ruin a good night's sleep. I have tried some self-inflating mats and although they're slightly more comfortable, they tend to be huge things. So my advice for you is to make this the area that you spend a little bit more on, especially if you are considering winter camping. I've spent out for a decent down sleeping bag with a comfort rating of minus nine. It's comfortable, warm and packs down really well too. And my new sleeping pad is amazing. I wish I'd got it sooner. It packs down to about the size of a tin can and the comfort and insulative values have proven their worth in the colder weather. Okay, it was pricey when compared to what I usually pay for gear, but it is an incredible improvement. And to be honest, if you added up the costs of all the other pads that I tried, I probably would have saved money from the start. So I will put links to my sleeping system below in the video description. Number five, 
Choosing your wild camping location. It'd be nice to say that before you go out for a wild camp, that you should stake out the area and find your ideal camping spot. In fact, many recommend that you do this. However, that's very rarely possible. For example, if you are heading into the mountains or onto the moor for a multi-day hike, chances are that it's going to be an area that you may not have seen before. Or if you have seen a great spot to camp in on previous visits, then chances are someone else has already set up in it. Before you go out, have a look over your map at the route for what appears to be good places to camp. You can generally tell by the terrain and the contour lines what the land will be like, but don't be afraid to improvise once you're on location. Once on your location and ready to set up, then have a look around at the terrain. Like ideally, you want somewhere level and dry to pitch up. You may want to pitch up relatively close to a water source so you can fill up water bottles, but not too close that if there are flash floods in the night that you're likely to get washed away. If you know the direction of the wind throughout the night, then look for somewhere to pitch that can shelter you from the worst. And if there are signs of congregating cattle, you may also want to be aware. I have slept a few times amongst bullocks and ponies, which although nothing actually came of it, it was an unnerving night wondering if he was going to get trampled. Which leads me nicely on to number six, be safe. Your safety is an important aspect of camping and there are a few ways you can prepare for a safe trip. Have an idea of your route before you set up and of possible camping locations along the route so you are as prepared as much as you can be before you set up. Also, let someone else know of your plans so that if something does happen and you get stranded, someone else will be able to point rescue services in the right direction. Also look into the terrain and the area that you are going to be exploring and find out its typical conditions for the specific dates that you are visiting. Some places are more inhospitable during the wet seasons and some locations such as Dartmoor have areas that are used by the military so you should research firing times. And if you are in any military zones it's also advised that if you find any shrapnel that you leave it where it is. If you are going out on your own always make sure that you have your phone on you with some battery left just in case of emergency. If you don't have a power bank and are running out of battery, then reserve it, switch it off and save it. Know who you are contacting in an emergency. Dial 999 request mountain rescue in your area. Also, it's obvious, but don't take any unnecessary risks. As mentioned previously, it's best to have a map, compass, and if possible, a GPS navigational app with you to help find your way or to let you know your whereabouts. There is also an app now that is increasingly recognised called What Free Words, which will translate your location into free words which you relay to the emergency services and they will pinpoint your location. However, this is still in its infancy and some suggest that variations of spellings of certain words could possibly hinder a rescue. So what other safety tips do you feel that I have missed? Maybe you can let me know in the comments. Number seven, keep a close eye on the weather. The weather is always temperamental and never more than in the hills and the mountains. You are higher up exposed and not only can the weather change and catch you out without much notice, but it's also more extreme up there. Stronger winds, heavier rain or snow, lower temperatures with a greater risk of lightning strike. So it really is important that you keep an eye on the weather leading up to and during your camping trip. And don't be afraid to change your plans if necessary or even postpone your trip if the weather looks too bad or unpredictable. The last thing that Mountain Rescue want to be doing is traipsing out onto the hills risking their life to save yours when it could have or should have been avoided in the first place. Of course there is much likelihood that you get caught out without much warning. You may have checked before you left and the weather was fine, but once you are out, the forecast changes and weather warnings are issued. It happens all the time. So keep an eye on it whenever you can and adjust your plans accordingly. Let us know which sites and apps you prefer to check your weather on in the comments below. Number eight, be considerate to others and your environment, or in large, don't be a dick. There is a certain etiquette with wild camping and that's what differentiates us from the rabble fly campers who created much mess and chaos during the pandemic. If you do it properly and responsibly, you will help maintain the reputation of wild camping. It's best that if you do wild camp anywhere that you arrive late and leave early. Do not camp for more than one night and preferably in small groups and small tents. The national parks are not campsites and they should never be treated as such. 
Discretion is the key with wild camping. And if you are sharing an area with other wild campers, then try to camp away from them, be as quiet as possible so as not to ruin their experience. I mean, most of it is just common decency, like the leave no trace rule. And I'm sure I'm singing to the choir here, but we have all witnessed the aftermath of some people with complete disregard for these beauty spots. People who leave the place in a much worse condition than they found it. Litter, discarded tents, fire pits dug into the ground, branches torn from trees. Actually, as much as we all like a campfire, most places exercise the no open fire policy. And this is especially important during prolonged dry spells and in woodlands and forests, but also places like Dartmoor, which is very peaty. In fact, a widespread fire took hold of Dartmoor only the other year during a wet February. So be sure to use a camping stove to cook your meals, which incidentally leads me on to number nine, packing food and water. As I mentioned earlier, Nathan and myself used to pack so much food that it easily added four or five kilograms onto our pack weight. If you want to limit your weight in your backpack, then you need to keep track of your meals and snacks. I have stopped taking pasties and lunch boxes full of crisps and chocolate and pork pies by now. You want to know how long you'll likely be out and how many meals you will need in that time, including breakfast, lunch, dinner and possibly supper. Food doesn't need to be heavy. Dehydrated meals are extremely light with high calorific value and they don't use as much gas as a boil in the bag meal. However, they can be quite expensive, but you'll be surprised actually how a lot of these brands now have some really tasty meals and there's nothing better than a hot meal on a cold hill. You can always prepare your own meals too, as I do, which I take in foil pouches that I can heat through in the stove, or you can get yourself a dehydrator and have a go at making your own dehydrated meals. As a cheap alternative, shop bought noodles and packet rice are great food products to pack into your bag but the energy produced from these meals may not be up to scratch for wild camping trips involving considerable distances of course for some of you cooking elaborate meals on the transa stove is part of the fun and if you want to compromise the weight in your backpack for the numerous ingredients then that's fine there is no right and wrong Snacks can be a great addition as well. One of my favourites is a fruit and nut mix, which is light and creates a sufficient amount of energy for your walking. I also like to add chocolate raisins into the mix just to give it that little extra sweetness. And then another favourite hiking snack for me is flapjacks or any oat bars for that matter. They are really great at slow producing energy to sustain your efforts whilst out walking. I have created and perfected a high energy hiking flapjack, which is a great treat out on the trail. You can find a link to that video in the video description. And for more protein, let's throw in some biltong and jerky. Again, it's light, full of energy and all important, really tasty then i guess you'll probably want a hot drink too sachet coffees go down well you can get the three in ones which you just add water but i've grown accustomed to taking coffee bags which i find absolutely awesome a lightweight coffee which is as close to the real thing as you can get without taking a percolator i do pack a small tub of coffee mate mixed with sugar to go with it for most of the above meals and drinks you will need plenty of water and we all know a liter of water is a kilogram in weight so most of us carry some form of water filtration system filtering water is an essential part of wild camping and so it's best to know how to do it properly and safely always make sure you fill up your bottles from running water unless it's a larger body of water like a lake or a tarn puddles and holes are best avoided when you collect water always try to get as close to the source as you can but if you can't then at least check upstream for a considerable distance to make sure that there are no dead animals or any other sources of contamination if you're like me and a little wary of filtering water then you can always carry some additional purification tablets to add to the filtered water or try to keep a bottle of fresh water for drinking and use the filtered water for boiling where possible number 10 how to toilet in the wild Going to the toilet on the hill is often a point that gets overlooked, but it is one of the most important points nonetheless. Excreting our food is part of the human process, but we can't just go dropping our guts anywhere. So let's have a look at the preferred method. Find a secluded spot away from footpaths and busy areas. You may also want to make sure that you are a good distance away from any water sources so you don't contaminate them too. Then with a small trowel, you cut a small deep trench which you lift out in one piece like turf. 
about 15 centimeters deep is ideal. Once you've done your business into the trench, you can add the toilet paper you may have used into the hole and replace the turf. Some argue that the toilet paper should be removed from sight and suggest taking some Ziploc bags to stash it in. That is completely up to you. And I would certainly agree with that when using wet wipes or any sanitary products. But to be perfectly honest, tissue paper is so thin and biodegradable that if buried properly, it would soon disintegrate. Another suggestion is to burn the paper before you fill it in the hole. Although to me, this does go against the open fires policy that many parks have. So there you are. That's my top 10 wild camping tips for beginners. If you have any tips that you think I may have missed or any feedback to any of my suggestions, then please leave a comment below. But in the meantime, just get out there Good luck, stay safe, and more importantly, enjoy yourselves. Cheese.